And I am going to uh, turn this over to Rachel Nemhauser um, with the ARC of King County, an incredible resource for any questions you have. And Rachel, I have made you co-host. And you, and you should have Sharon. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sherilyn. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I loved what you were saying about <clears throat> having parents join the work that you're doing who aren't Seattle parents. I'm not a Seattle parent. My kids grew up in a different school district, but I've loved um, kind of partnering with you guys over the years and watching what you do. And you have you do amazing work in um, in Seattle. So thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Like Sherilyn said, I'm here from the Arc of King County. I am the Director of Information and Family Support. I've been overseeing our um, IEP Parent Partner Program since I think 2017 when we started it. And oh, since that time, I've spoken to hundreds of parents about their special ed concerns and just sharing their hearing their stories. I'm also the parent myself of a um, IEP student. My son Nate is in his um, second to last year out of his high school transition program. He's 19. And my oldest son, Isaac, went all through middle school and high school with a 504 plan and then went away to college and graduated and now is uh, living and working out of state. So we've done the 504 thing, we've done the IEP thing, and um, I'm here to share some of my experiences and um, what I've learned from supporting families over the years. Uh, some of you might have heard a presentation I've done in the past that was 10 tips for advocating for your child. So today's presentation is a kind of a 2.0 for that. But if you missed that first presentation, that's totally okay. Today's presentation is focusing less on um, the whole in-depth special ed advocacy and is instead focusing on um, preparing for a meeting. I, we hear, we get this call quite often from families who um, have a meeting coming and they feel really unprepared and almost, and I don't know if anyone has ever felt this way, it almost just feels unfair or outnumbered before you even go in the door. You feel like um, you're really, uh, the power differential isn't quite, doesn't feel even. So um, this presentation is designed to address some of those apprehension, some of those concerns that can come before a meeting and help you prepare so you can go into the meeting and feel like you're able to effectively participate. Uh, I'm going to talk for about an hour, but please jump in with questions. Using the chat for questions would probably be the best, um, and I'll try to to address them as I can or ask in some cases if we could hold off till the end. Um, all right. Well, let me ask this first and foremost. I'd love with a show of hands. I can't really see you, so you'd have to use the the hand raise button if you know how. How many of you have ever gone to an IEP meeting? Okay. <laughs> I see a lot of raised hands. All right, so I'm not talking to a room full of novices. Got it. How many of you have ever headed into a meeting feeling insecure or unprepared? Or wishing you knew more heading into that meeting? Okay. <laughs> Cool. Um, I see that number going down, which is great. That means some of you have gone to meetings feeling really good. And I, I appreciate that. Um, and maybe some of you have had some, uh, some of the same concerns that I have of feeling a little over overwhelmed or intimidated. Um, here's what I'm hoping to cover today. I don't know if these are actually 10 things. I think I got to nine, sorry. So it's nine tips. Um, I see that there's one hand still up. Is that just because it wasn't put down or is there a question? Okay, all right. Um, well, here's what I hope to cover today, assuming we have time. Very brief overview of special ed law, because I think that really helps when you're preparing to go to a meeting. A brief overview of just how the special ed cycle works. We're gonna talk about identifying the purpose of the meeting identifying your goals for the meeting, which can sometimes be different, identifying who will be at the meeting and who you'd like to invite. We're gonna talk about finding the relevant data you need to support your perspective. 
Uh, most importantly, maybe we're going to talk about ensuring that your voice is heard during that meeting and ensuring that your child's voice is heard. And then we're going to talk really briefly about what to do after the meeting. Um, all right, if there's something you're hoping I'm going to talk about that you don't see here, please list it in the chat and I'll try to incorporate it if I can. But with that, let's just jump in to the two governing laws of special education. These are federal laws. They um, dictate special education across the entire United States. Um, each state and each district, and I would say even sometimes each school might interpret these differently, but these are federal laws. The first one is Section 504. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 gave civil rights to students with disabilities. So it allowed for the reasonable accommodations that are necessary for every student to access their education. And we, that could be something as simple as a ramp allowing students with wheelchairs to, access, to physically access the building. It could be something more complicated like a um, student who's hearing impaired having uh, being in a classroom with amplification if needed. It could also be um, the su supports a student needs so that their behavior doesn't interfere with their learning. Um, Section 504 gives civil rights to people with disabilities. The second federal law is IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act. You've probably heard of IDEA. It gives our students access to FAPE, which you've probably heard, free and appropriate public education. Free and public education are pretty clear. Appropriate can sometimes be a little confusing or a little vague, and that's where some um, struggles or disagreements can fall. But IDEA gives students with disabilities a free and appropriate public education, including the right to be educated in their least restrictive environment. The, and the thing I really hope you take away from this slide and from these two laws, more than anything else, it's so dense, it's so complicated, but I really think we can simplify it to this. Your student is entitled to go to school and they're entitled to learn. They're entitled to have whatever support and services and resources they need so they can learn and so they can access their education. This can be a really hard truth to remember when we have a kid who might require a lot in order to access their learning. And it could be really hard sitting in a meeting to want to, act, to feel confident advocating for our kid that could be making it difficult for, their, for the, the adults around them. But most important is that our children have a right to learn. Um, just checking the chat. chat. Okay, I'll come back to that. Um, so those are the two federal laws. And I think that if you could go into every IEP meeting or every meeting with, the, with your school, student's team, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that your child has a right to be there and has a right to get what they need to be successful, that could really go a long way in your advocacy. So moving on from that, let's talk about the special education process, because I think another important part of feeling confident when you're entering a meeting is to understand the, the cycle of special ed and where you are in that cycle. A lot of times when families call me at the ARC to express a concern, they know that they're unhappy about something and they know that things aren't going the way they want but they often don't know where in this process they are. And without knowing that, then it could be really hard to know how to address that problem. So let me just like in five minutes, give a really quick overview of how special education works, which is a really lofty goal for five minutes, but let's see how I do. Um, special ed is always gonna start with a referral. For my student, that referral came from a birth to three center back when he was at a uh, kindering center when he was zero to three. They made a referral to, spe to the special ed program in his uh, school district. A special ed referral can come at any age and it can come from anyone. Um, but e whoever makes this referral and whenever it's made, it's someone saying to the school team, I have concerns about this student and think they might need additional, they might need um, 
specialized instruction or special education services, I would like you to test him or her and find out. And obviously I'm massively um, summarizing here. Uh, the school team hopefully will agree with that referral and will do an evaluation in a number of areas to determine if your student is eligible for special ed. I could do a whole separate presentation on eligibility, but my understanding, it really comes down to a test score. Are they, I think it's two and a half standard deviation below normal in any one area, makes them eligible for an IEP. So the, the team does an IEP, does an evaluation. Let's assume for the sake of this conversation that they determine, yes, your student is eligible in any number of these of areas. Rachel. Yeah. This is Cheryl Lynn. I want the interpreter to know, the ASL interpreter to know. I have reached um, them and they are contacting the interpreter who will be joining. So I hope we see someone in a few minutes. If not, I will call back. Thanks for the update, Sherilyn. And that actually got me to look at um, the comment, Sh uh, Cheryl, I see your comment that you never had, a referral never happened. Right, and I'm I'm really massively summarizing here. I'm telling like in the easiest case, any one of these steps could <laughs> something could could not go according to plan. This is kind of best case scenario. It does frequently happen that a person, a parent, feels their child needs special education services, and the school doesn't agree. Unfortunately, um, and what is the other? My seventh grader has a fairly new IEP, but one of her medical providers has recommended I call a follow up meeting to evaluate. What additional information would be valuable to encourage consideration? All right, well, we'll hopefully come to that question, but that might be a little bit of an off topic question that I just, it's a great question. I just don't know if I'll have time to address it, but I'll try my best. For the sake of this conversation, they do the, eye of the evaluation. They determine the student is eligible for an IEP. The team all comes together and, and the team is going to include the parent. We're going to talk more about who's going to be at that meeting a little bit later. But a team comes together and the team includes you, the parent. And that team together crafts an individualized education plan or an IEP. Often what it ends up looking like, at least I, this is in my district, I'm going to assume, and I see this in districts across the county. You show up at a meeting, they hand you a draft or maybe they've sent it to you beforehand, but it looks like a finalized document. It looks just like an IEP and it looks like they've done all the crafting of the IEP before you even got there. I don't know if anyone else has had that experience, but either way that, that document they give you is a draft. And as a team, you work together to change it, update it. Hopefully everybody agrees to it and um, you finalize it. After it's finalized, within a few days, it's implemented. That means we start doing everything that's in that IEP. Every service that's promised is supposed to be provided. Every um, accommodation, every mi uh, minute of therapy or, or specially designed instruction should all be um, provided right away. Or within a couple days, it usually takes to get it started. From that point on, there should be pretty heavy data collection going on. So while your student is now um, going to their classes and going to their specialized instruction and, or receiving their specialized instruction and working on all these new skills and goals, somebody should be kind of keeping track of how that's going. And not just a vague, yeah, it seems like it's getting better. There should actually be some pretty, like I said, heavy duty data collection. A trained eye might notice in a, in a special ed classroom that a para or a teacher is walking around with a piece of paper and a pencil and is making tick marks. How many times they had to ask one student to put their jacket on or how many times they had to remind a student to sit still during circle time. This data collection is a really important part of the process because it helps us know, not just based on our gut instinct, but with actual numbers, if the student is doing well or not on those goals. And yes, you're right, data collection that is objective. He's a joy to work with is not, well, that might be one piece of data, but that's not the kind of data collection we're talking about. It's like, how many times out of 10 is he putting on his jacket on without more than one reminder, if that's his IEP goal, for example. 
um, every quarter, you should be getting progress reports that tell you how he's doing on those goals. It should cut there. It's not a report card, but it comes around the same time as the report card. If your student, your student should be receiving a gen ed report card also based on, well, anyway, different subject, but the data, um, the progress reports should come frequently and should tell you how he's doing. He's on track to make that goal. He's making progress, but we might not make that goal or we're not going to, you know, we're, we're not making any progress, something like that. Again, a really informative tool for you as a parent are, how's he doing? If you don't want to let a whole year go by without a goal being made, without progress being made, keep a close watch on those progress reports. So every year we start that process again. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and Cheryl, I see your comment that you've never had data taken with any level of fidelity. I I think that's enough. We could do a whole other presentation on that. So I, I hear what you're saying. And I, it is like data, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later in the presentation, to me is like the um, the language of special ed. Much more than my child is happy or my child is doing well or my child is overwhelmed. It's my child is or is not making progress on their goals. Like that's kind of the language special educators speak. And the way that we make those statements is based on the data. And so you're right. The fidelity of the data is really critical. Every year we go back to the port to rewriting the IEP. Every three years, they do the whole battery of reevaluations. Um, those reevaluations don't have to be every three years. They can, they have to be a max, a minimum of every three years or maximum once a year. So you don't have to wait three years if there's a reason you might need it sooner. And one thing I want to say about evaluations, and it's in this little box, uh, yellow, orange box over in the bottom left. If you disagree with the results of the evaluation, you have a recourse. You have the right to an individual. I always forget the acronyms, an IEE, an independent educational evaluation, um, where you could go get basically a second opinion, get your student evaluated by an outside source paid for by the school district. If um, So like say they do an evaluation in special ed and in math and they say, well, he doesn't qualify in math and he doesn't need special ed. He's doing fine. You might say, I completely disagree, and I'm, I am I want to go get a second opinion. The school district will hopefully approve that request and um, give you a list of like in-network providers, kind of the way health insurance works. They'll give you a list of places where you could get a, a second opinion that they'll pay for. You go get that second opinion. Now, say the results actually tell you exactly what you believed. Really behind, really struggling in math you could bring those results back to the IEP team. The IEP team is required to um, take those results into consideration, but here's the, the um, kicker. They're not required to take those results. They're just required to take them into consideration. So that can be a frustrating part of the process, but nevertheless, you have a right to do that. Is qualifying data just how they are doing against academic goals? What about impact on education or mental health? Yeah, really good question. I, I think what you're saying is like, are we only measuring success based on if they're meeting goals? What about like their mental health, their overwhelm, their stress, their anxiety? I have to say that I don't see the professionals care. So I definitely don't want to say my experience is they don't care. I They obviously care if they see a student in distress, but the thing that motivates change in my observation or in my experience is the data that I, you know, I hope that that's not everybody's experience. So I, I, I'm only sharing like what I've observed or what I've experienced personally, that me saying, um, a parent saying he's really stressed every day when he comes to school, doesn't get the reaction that I looked at the data and he's not making any progress on any of his goals. Rachel. Which is just unfortunate. Yeah. This is Cheryl Lynn. 
It was interesting. I was having a conversation with someone earlier today who's been through a lot of different things. And what this parent found was if there was a struggle to get to school or when there was a struggle to get to school, as soon as the kid was in school, they whether took out a piece of paper or a notebook or on their phone, made a note of what time they arrived and what the issue might have been, you know, and, and it can vary as with different school mm-hmm. or challenges. And then maybe if the child had said something, either, you know, then there was not a reference, then had that quote, then every once a week, the parent would take that and email it. And after so the, that, they were kind of collecting their own data. Right. And yeah. after the course of six months, and I have heard that if you, okay. if you are seeing experiences where your kid um, is doing well in school, but coming home and collapsing, which I've heard a lot from also yeah, the parents, sure. that to track that and then to say, you know, because then you do have that opportunity to say, what it's costing them in school is all the masking and all the the emotional elements Mm -hmm. just a consideration yeah no i think that's great advice i mean anything you can do to paint that picture is going to help i so i'm not at all telling you like or i hope it's not coming across that i'm saying that doesn't matter because like how they're doing mental health wise matters more than any anything but sometimes i think that or often i just see that getting lost in conversations about data unfortunately any questions about this kind of this overall cycle or this process? Um, Angela, yeah. Hi, this is Angela. I wanted to say you you said about the process, you show up and the, the stuff is there. I met, I learned at one of these meetings about the document that's online that the the PTA the uh, uh, provides. And I actually took, I read through it and took those accommodations and handed it before the IEP meeting and they integrated them in that yeah. document I got yeah. handed. So I just wanted to flag that resources uh, is on the website. If you and could put did. a link for that in the chat, I think that would yeah. be really right. helpful. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to come, we're going to talk more about that. So I'm going to hold off on that, but that's a great, that's great advice. So here's why, here's. So now you know the general law, your kid has a right to be there and your kid has a right to get what they need to succeed. And you kind of know how the process works. It's the same cycle over and over again. Now you have a meeting coming up. First, I think it's really important to make sure you understand the purpose of this meeting. What is this meeting? Is it an annual IEP meeting? That's um, this right here, where we review the annual IEP, update goals, um, change any, update accommodations, that sort of thing. Is it evaluation results? Is it this part of the meeting, of the cycle where we just, our kids had the evaluation and they're calling us in to share the results with us? Is it um, an extra meeting sometime throughout the year to amend the IEP? Because as we all know, the IEP, or I hope we all know, the IEP is a fluid document that could be amended and updated as needed throughout the year. Is it a problem solving meeting? Like something's going wrong and the team has been called together to see if we can figure out how to help whatever the problem is. Is it just a routine check-in? Like maybe a few times a year we come together just to see how things are going. Or is it a parent-teacher conference, which is separate from the IEP altogether? It might seem on the surface, like this is pretty obvious, but I frequently see misunderstanding about when there's a meeting, what the meeting is for. Is it an annual IEP meeting or is it something different? And I think it's really important to know because as I I said at the bottom, the purpose of the meeting is going to impact and probably limit, in some cases, what can be discussed or accomplished at the meeting. So for example, this is something that I ran into. When my son was in um, kindergarten and he was put in a self-contained program and for the next year, I really wanted him moved to gen ed. I showed up to that meet- to a meeting thinking we were gonna discuss his placement, but actually it was an evaluation results meeting. It was them going over the results of his six year Eva, re-eval, you know, they happen every three years. Um, it was really frustrating to me. They won't let their their um, 
blocking me. They're filibustering me. They won't let me talk about the one thing I'm here to talk about. But it, it turns out I was at the wrong meeting for that. So it really does help to start by understanding what this meeting is, who called the meeting, and what the purpose of the meeting is. It's worth noting, for example, that an annual IEP meeting has a pretty um, rigid list of things that needs to accomplish before the meeting ends. So they might be less inclined to talk about, to do some like intensive problem solving or to go through the results of an evaluation. Thank you. <laughs> Bedtime just started happening right outside my door. So my husband closed the door. That was just in the nick of time. <laughs> anyway, um, it's important. So my point is make sure you understand the point of the meeting. Understanding ahead of time the purpose of the meeting can really prevent a lot of frustration or misunderstanding. Um, if your child has a new diagnosis that sheds new light on the challenges that's ever come up before, can we bring that? Um, no, you can bring outside evaluations to an IEP me team meeting at any time. Um, any questions about this, about identifying the purpose of the meeting? Next piece of advice, identify your goals for the meeting. So it happens so often that the goals the team has are different than the goals that the parent might have. So I listed just some potential goals that you might have. This is just a sampling. You might have something additional to add. Um, you might be going to a goal do to a meeting to request a change to the IEP. That's not something that could just happen over the phone in most cases. To change an IEP, that's something you'd need to meet with the team about. It could be um, adding a new goal or updating a goal, or it could be the same adding or updating an accommodation. You might have a goal to cut while the team is together, let's brainstorm a solution to this problem. Um, your I, your goal for the meeting may be to just get to know the members of the IEP team. I don't know if any of you, especially those of you whose kids um, are minimally able to um, speak verbally, may not come home and tell you all the people they're working with or the things they're doing at school. Um, you might just by October, November think, I want to get the team together just so I know who these people are. The meeting, your goal for the meeting may be to express a concern, like my son is really stressed out, really upset, or um, he's never eating his lunch, or he's coming home with soiled pants every day, whatever your concern is, that might be your purpose of the, your goal. You may want to follow up on a previous concern. We talked last month about that toilet issue. Can we, now that we're back together, I want to follow up and check in and see if we've seen implemented the changes we've discussed and if we've seen any improvement. You may want to just hear how things are going. It's Again, if you have a kid who doesn't tell you much about what goes on during the day, um, you might want the team together to just hear, is, is it school going well? Are things okay? Again, if, they, if you really want to know how things are going, the school would encourage you to chat, to look at the data. But we all know there's more we care about than just the data. You may your goal for this meeting might be to learn more about how your about your student and how he or she learns. You may have many of these goals. I would guess you're rarely going to a meeting with just one. But I think considering ahead of time what is your priority to take away from this meeting. And I would ask yourself, do my goals match the purpose of the meeting? So for example, if the purpose of the meeting is evaluation results. It may not be the time to talk about placement or to talk about solu brainstorming solutions to a problem. If the purpose of the meeting is to brainstorm solutions to a problem, it might not be the time to um, just chit chat and get to know the team. So I would be sure as you're preparing for a meeting to be considering what does my purpose, my goal match what the team's goals are and what they hope to accomplish? 
Sherilyn, I see you turned your camera on. Does that mean you had a question, something to say? Uh, just that I was going to come back in and put on chat just the part where um, I was just curious if anyone here had actually kind of created an agenda going. Oh, in. we're coming to that. Okay. Oh, you see, you're blowing my my exciting headline <laughs> comments. No, yes, I the, I love an agenda. We're going to talk about that. And Cheryl, I see your comment. If meeting scheduling is hard, you keep track of when the annual is due. I want to share when um, my son was, I think, in thir second or third grade, the special ed teacher came to me and said, it's an emergency. The IEP deadline is next week. We won't be able to meet with you. Would you mind if we just meet without you? And then we'll fill you in later. And I, being like wanting to just be helpful and cooperative and totally naive, said, sure. And it was fine. I don't remember anything bad coming out of it, except I walked away feeling kind of yucky. The same exact thing happened the year later. Clearly, this was just a special ed teacher who didn't know how to get ahead of things. <laughs> but by the second year, I was like, well, no, wait a minute. I You can't just keep having IEP meetings year after year without me. And then by the that after that happened, I did exactly what you said. And I made a, a note every, the deadline is sometime in February. So in January, I'm going to reach out and make sure that doesn't happen again. I think that's a great piece of advice. Along with don't let them talk you out of attending your own IEP meeting. <laughs> that's my other piece of advice. When they tell you things like um, the deadline, it has to be done by Friday or whatever. That is a them problem. I'm not minimizing it. It's important. Their deadlines are important. But if they let it get to the point where they're so close to the deadline that they can't fit a meeting in, that's not your problem to correct or fix for them. That's a them problem. They can request an extension if they need to. That's allowed. So don't, don't let them freak you out by saying the deadline, the deadline. Any questions about identifying your goals for the meeting? So let's talk about sorry this is Cheryl Lynn if yeah. you want to ask a question anonymously you also can just send it to me directly oh yeah please or you can send it to me and ask anonymously and I, I'll just read it out loud and won't share your name whatever you're comfortable with is fine so let's talk about who is going to be at the meeting um and this is based on on the law the child's parents ha ha see Nate's teacher from third grade didn't didn't read line one the child's parents or a representative selected by the parent or both. So that says parents and anyone you want to bring with you, mom and dad. So that could be grandma. That could be um, an adult sibling. It could be a, um, a psychologist or behavior therapist. Anyone you think would be helpful to be there. There should be at least one general education teacher. That's the law. Uh, it. I don't know how often do you go to IEP meetings and it's the PE teacher. I don't understand <laughs> why that's the case, but the P <laughs> thank you, Cheryl. Somehow the IEP team, it requires a gen ed teacher and more often than not, it appears to be the PE teacher, which I mean, it's nice because we get good conversations about um, how things are going for that student in PE. But I often wish that we also had the gen ed English teacher or social studies teacher or something like that. Um, at least one special education teacher or service provider. A school district representative who is qualified to provide or supervise the provision of special ed instruction. That means that person has to understand how special ed works. They have to be knowledgeable about the general curriculum and knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the resources of the district. The individual who conducted the assessments of the students, and that's often a school psychologist, but it could also be, in my son's team, his speech therapist does his speech evaluation, the OT does the OT evaluation, um, the special ed teacher does the behavioral evaluation, so um, it could be different people, but in most cases, they're referring to the school psychologist. Um, other people with specific expertise or knowledge of the student. That's kind of what I was getting at before. Anyone you want to know, you want to be there. Um, 
and any it looks like anyone in the district wants to be there. Uh, you you don't need the school district's permission to bring someone with you. I think it's um, courtesy to give the district a heads up that you're bringing a person with you um, because nobody likes to be surprised. I don't think there's any rules that say you have to do that. It's just a courtesy in my opinion. Um, and I think especially with Zoom links and with security and public schools, they get a little, um, a little nervous if someone they don't know shows up in the school building. So it's just, I think, courtesy to share. If you are bringing a lawyer, I would definitely share that because they're going to want to bring their own lawyer. I've been to an IEP meeting where the parent showed up with a lawyer without warning ahead of time and the, the team just refused to meet and the meeting got canceled. So I would be really upfront about that. And then the last person is the student. We're going to talk a little bit more about including the student in a few minutes. Um, so that's who will be at the meeting. My understanding is you have a right to excuse people from the meeting. Um, like for example, if you're really there to talk about um, behavioral concerns, you might find that you don't need um, I don't know. I can't think of a good example, but you don't need the um, PE teacher there. For example, I don't, you know, whatever the, oops, sorry. Um, and I only bring that up about excusing people from meetings because it makes scheduling meetings easier. If you have an urgent need to have a meeting so you can amend the IEP, you you have a right to insist that all these people are there. But you also have a right to say, I'm willing to just meet with the special ed teacher and the school administrator so we could just quickly amend this IEP as opposed to demanding everybody be there. Um, any questions about any of that? So I told you we'd talk about data, always a highlight in a presentation. And like I said earlier, schools speak the language of data. It It's to me kind of a sad truth because when we're talking about like the general well-being of our kids, that doesn't always have the same impact as um, data. Goal achievement is the a strong measure of success or failure. From what I could tell, the way schools are held accountable, the way schools prove that they're using their special ed funds appropriately, is by showing that their students are meeting their goals. So you, with that in mind, you can imagine schools are rather invested in our kids meeting their goals, which is can be a, a powerful tool when we think about it like that. If it matters that much to them that our kids meet their goals, then I would hope they're gonna pay extra attention when our kids are not meeting their goals because it matters a lot to them. So as you're heading into an IEP meeting with, uh, things in mind that you, with your own priorities in mind, maybe changes you want to make. Like in my story that I shared, I know I want him to be moved to gen ed from a special ed, from a self-contained program. Whatever your um, priorities are for that meeting, think about what data can help me make that point. Um, assessment data, that's those three-year evaluations, and data collected during class time should be used to assist the IEP team in problem solving goal setting, and creating specially designed instruction. So when you think about it like that, it kind of helps explain the I in IEP. This document should be really individualized. Every single item on that IEP should be organically um, produced from the assessment and, the, and data and data collected during class. And that data is a, a powerful tool for you. If I um, wanted, this is when I argued for self for a special ed, for gen ed, this is long before I understood data. So I'm not gonna share how I did it, but I will share how I should have done it or could have done it. I may have made the, I could have made the point, if you look at his IEP goals, he's not meeting his goals in gen ed, in special ed. 
he's not meeting his speech goals. And I might pause it. That's because he's not around other kids who use verbal speech. He's not um, meeting some of his behavioral goals because um, he doesn't have peer models that are modeling the kinds of behavior we're trying to teach him. Therefore, we might make the case that he would have more success in a different placement. So that's how you could use data to sort of make your argument. Any changes to the IEP should be informed with the use of data. And this is a story I love to tell. When my son started ninth grade, the transition from middle school to high school was a little rough and his behavior at the beginning of ninth grade got a little spicy. And his, gen ed, his um, teacher came to me and said, I'd like to up update the IEP to add a one-on-one -on -one para for him to support his behavior. And I said, I actually don't want to do that. He used to have a one-on-one. -on -one. We've moved away from having a one-on-one. -on -one, and that seems like a backwards slide. Her answer was, I, unfortunately, it's not your decision. It's an IEP team decision. Fair. It actually is. I didn't like that, but it is. <laughs> Any change to the IEP should be a team decision. She said, what, I, what I'm going to do is collect data for a month. I'm going to keep track of how many minutes a day he actually requires the use of a para. And then we'll come together as a team and explore that data and decide what he really needs. She did that and, um, and it actually turned out he didn't need a para, his behavior slowly improved over time. I love that story because um, it shows how data can be used to slow things down. When a change is about to happen that you're not that comfortable with, whoa, whoa, whoa what data are you using to make that decision? Or show, I love like, show me the data you're using to make that decision or show me the data you're using to say no to my request. Um, so getting that data ahead of time as you prepare for a meeting can be helpful. You, if you don't, have, if you're not the kind of person who keeps really good records, I'm not. If you don't have every past pro, uh, progress report and three year reavals from years past, you this someone has them, reach out to the special ed teacher and ask them for them. It, they'll find it for you. Um, there's a record of it somewhere. You also have a right to ask the teacher for any data they're collecting on a certain goal in the classroom. Like Cheryl said earlier, that doesn't mean you're getting good data, but you do have a right to ask for it and they do have to pr provide it if you ask for it. So that could be really useful. If, you're, if your suspicion all along has been um, he's having more behavioral challenges at school and then they're really telling me or then, then he should be. And you want to address that with the team at, at the meeting. You might in anticipation of the meeting, call the teacher and say, can you um, provide me before the meeting with all the data you've collected on that behavior goal? I want to get a sense of how it's going before the meeting. And they should be able to do that. If they don't, if they don't have data to show you, that means they're out of compliance and that's problematic. So, um, I mean, we don't want to drive them crazy demanding data all the time, but it's a good tool when you need it and they are obligated to share it with you. Like I said earlier, you should be getting quarterly reports that can really help you prepare and inform you for a, a meeting. They're also, if I get a quarterly report that shows my kid's not making any progress. I'm not waiting for a meeting, by the way. That's when I request a meeting because that's problematic also if you're, if, you know, a quarter or two quarters have gone by and your student's just not making any progress. You're also encouraged to share your own data. I think, um, Sherilyn, you were talking about that before, Collect, writing down every day why he didn't want to go to school this day, that day, or how long it took to get him out of the car in the parking lot. Or um, I think work samples can be really good. I, I've had, had um, a team once tell me that Nate had met his handwriting goal to write his name, and I brought in samples, and I was like, this this isn't what we're striving, you know, I hope we have higher standards than that. I don't think he met this goal. So you can bring in those work samples. I also encourage um, for those after school meltdowns or homework fights or refusing to get out to leave the house in the morning, occasionally a video. I really want to protect the dignity of my child. So I encourage you to be really thoughtful with that. But sometimes the team just doesn't un believe you or doesn't understand what you're trying to describe. And I think video can be a powerful tool. And that's data also. Um, 
Okay, I think I I think this last item I already said, but out of order. So my point from this slide is gather your data before you go in the meeting. Even if you're just thinking about it, think about what um about how they're doing and how you want them to be doing and that the school wants them to succeed. I see, I keep samples of work. It really helps. I've also done videos, not a lot, just one or two when needed. Exactly. Like, I don't want to humiliate my kid with showing everyone he goes to school with that he had a meltdown. <laughs> That's not the purpose here. But I do think um, sometimes we might say he's really sad after school and they don't understand that you're talking about like tears and crying and hiding and all of these things that it's sometimes a video is just the only way. Any questions about data? And I really think identifying your goals for the meeting and finding the relevant data to support those goals goes hand in hand, if that makes sense. So if I have um, a parent who says, my goal for that next meeting is that I convince them he needs um, a one-on-one. -on -one. That's a really common one. My goal for that meeting is that I convince them he needs a one-on-one. -on -one. one way that I would do that is I would um, kind of like Nate's parent, a teacher did. Oops. I'd ask them how many, I want them to be um, collecting data on how many minutes he kind of is requiring a one-on-one -on -one anyway. That's one great request. I would also want to be looking at all his goals and finding how might he better meet that goal if he had a one-on-one -on -one with him. So you can look at every single goal and say, well, he's not making much progress, but if he has this person sitting next to him who could X, Y, or Z with him, he's more likely to meet that goal. So I think this slide and the next slide are the two most important. It, ensuring your voice is heard. You could do all the prepping in the world. You could understand the law. You could be perfectly in the right in the things you want for your kid. And then you show up at a meeting and you're outnumbered like 10 to one with school staff. And um, it, it, the whole thing lasts 40 minutes and you barely even know it started and it's over. And maybe um, you have your own disabilities or your own language barriers that make it hard to engage before you know it you never got to say what was on your mind. That I, I'm assuming that's not just me that that happens too. I see it happen a lot. Um, so let's talk about how to ensure that your voice is heard at these meetings, at, at whatever meeting you're at. Most important, you are an equal member of the IEP team and your voice matters. So knowing that to me is really key. I will say, and I'll remind you, you're not more important than anyone else. You're not the head member. I've heard some parents kind of think I'm, my voice matters the most because I'm the parent. That's not the case. We're all equal members and decisions are made by consensus. That means decisions should be made. Um, would it be possible to share the chat or slide the agenda at the next transition? Is that a question for me or is that for the for the um, one of the coordinators, I'm not sure. Sorry, this is Katie. I should have uh, sent that directly to one of the coordinators. Okay. <laughs> I apologize okay, that's for fine. the distraction for you. <laughs> no worries. Um, decisions are made by consensus. They're not by majority. It's not like a vote. Let's all vote and see if he should be in gen ed or not. It should get to the point where everyone agrees before a decision is made. Before you go to an IEP meeting, like if it's the annual meeting, for example, and you're going to be re rewriting an IEP, ask for a draft of the IEP or any relevant documentation ahead of the meeting so you could prepare. They are not required to provide a draft, but my understanding is they're required to try to provide one if you ask. And my experience is when they when you ask, they usually do. And even sometimes, or often when you don't ask, they they still will provide one, which is really nice. I encourage you to use that draft to help you prepare. Sit with it with a pencil, put X's through the things you hate, question marks next to the things you don't understand, you know, highlight the things you love and want more of. Just 
take some time to familiarize yourself with it. And I see a great question. How far in advance is reasonable to ask for the draft? I think a week or two in advance is reasonable. I normally don't see it being given out till two to three days in advance. And I think that's usually because they're not ready. They don't have it done yet. I don't think it's that they're holding withholding it. I don't see that happen. I just think they usually are kind of finishing it at the last minute. So my experience is most people seem to get it two, three, four days in advance. But I would ask a week or two in advance and then follow up every few days if you don't get it. Um, before going to a meeting, it looks like there's an interpreter in the waiting room. So I'm going to let that person in. Cheryl and I just let the interpreter in. Um, compose, this is, now this comes to Sherilyn's comment about an agenda. Compose a list of your top priorities and send it to the team ahead of time. This is my favorite tool. And I realized the power of it, the time I did it and showed up and they had made copies of my agenda and put it at everybody's seat at the table. That really helped make sure that even though they only schedule 40 minutes for a meeting and that's nowhere near enough time, if we're going to run out of time, it's not going to be on the things that I care about. We're going to run out of time on the things they might care about. Um, sending that agenda ahead of time helps make sure that your goals and your priorities are addressed. Um, I strongly recommend that if at all possible. And I love helping people make those agendas. So please reach out to me if that's something I can help with. Sometimes you just need to talk it through and figure out these are the top things I want to address. And I'll encourage you to keep that list as brief as you can. If you send a list with 20 items, they might be less, less open-minded to addressing all of them. Here's what I think is really important. It is okay to ask clarifying questions. It's okay to slow them down. Those meetings go so fast and you're like, wait, what did you just say about speech therapy? And they're on to math. Or what did you just say about, about speech therapy? And they're on to um, something else altogether. Like it it's, can be really hard to keep up and you, it can be embarrassing. I know it, but it's okay to say, can you slow down or can we go back to this? I'm not ready to move on to the next subject yet. I still have questions. They're super invested in finishing this in their one, in that 40 minutes or that 60 minutes that they've set aside. But again, that's, I don't want to take advantage. I don't want to mistreat them. I don't want to waste their time. Like I have the utmost respect for how busy and how overloaded the, these teams are. But I also know I get a time with the team like once or twice a year. And I want to make sure we use that time to really have the, the important conversations that need to be had. So if it ends up taking a second meeting, that's okay. It's okay to ask clarifying questions and it's okay to ask them to slow down. Um, yeah, I see good comments about the agenda. Five issues. Yeah, I usually try to keep it to five or less as well. Um, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but though I think um, three to five at the most is a good idea. Choose your battles. And I think I, I think think ahead of time, sort of like when you go to a car dealership and you're like, this is the lowest I'm willing to go. This is the highest I'm willing to go. Um, you don't, I would think about that ahead of time and you can ask for three or four things knowing in the end, if I just get this, I'll be really happy. So those extra couple of things you ask for are like negotiating tools. I hate to think of it like that, but I do think um, that could help in, some of the negotiation and discussion that goes on. Like really, if I think about it, what I want more than anything else is for him to make progress in speech this year. So if I really can only get one thing, it would be more SDI in speech. And I'm willing to forego whatever, another, you know, an extra, extra OT, as long as this time we can get extra speech. I think it's helpful. And if you're battling every single thing, it, it leads to a lot of frustration for everyone. And I don't know that it necessarily leads to a better IEP in the end. We I, And that could definitely be up for debate. That's more maybe my approach than anything else. Um, but I, my advice at least is to choose your battles. 
if you are non-English speaking, if you are um, hearing impaired, insist on an interpreter, insist on um, translated materials. You are entitled to an interpreter at every meeting. If you show up to a meeting and there's no interpreter there, I would refuse to do the meeting. I, I've seen it happen. I've helped parents do that. It's not fair to expect you to have a meeting about the most important thing in your life, your child, in a language you don't understand. And the same is true for um, translated materials. You have a right to ask for documentation in your native language, um, IEPs and other important material. Um, yeah. Uh, I also want to point out that parents are, oh wait, I see, and a professional interpreter, not the person they find in the school. Yeah, agreed. Somebody who's good at this, not, I've seen this happen so often, the younger sibling or the neurotypical sibling. Let's try to avoid that if possible, if at all possible. Um, the Spanish teacher should not be coming down to to interpret. There should be an interpreter there. Um, if you, as the parent, identify as having a disability, you are entitled to 504 accommodations. You're entitled to the same accommodations your child is to access the materials and access the process. So I worked with a parent who is autistic and she has two kids that are both have, that are, they're identical twins and they have the same genetic disorder and they have very high needs. And for her with her learning disabilities and her autism, managing their both of their really complex needs in IEP settings can be very overwhelming and really challenging. So she and I, before we even started the IEP process, made a list of the accommodations she needed. She has visual issues. So she asked for all documents in large print. She asked for um, all for extra time for all meetings because she needed things to be slow and to be read out loud for her. She asked for the draft to be given to her extra, extra in advance. Those are just some of the examples. You have a right to ask for that if you have if you're a person with a disability. We could have a whole conversation about whether um, it's safe to tell a school team you have a disability. Um, uh, wait, I want. I feel like I'm falling behind. I just saw angry emojis in the chat. In the chat, um, the new guy from the district said that they were trying to create accommodations without creating a leg. Up. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to go off on that because I could, but that's ridiculous. Um, because the accommodations are to kind of level the playing field, not give anyone a leg up. But regardless, if you have a disability, you have a right to access accommodations. I'll also say schedule a part two. I really hate at the end of the meeting when they're like, let's just really quickly go through the end of this. And then they end up skating through placement accommodations. All these things that take place right at the end, well, because we spend so much time talking about the wording on the speech goals that by the time we get to the end of the meeting, we're, we're out of time. It's okay to say, I think we should stop here and schedule a part two. I also love a part two for a, num a couple other reasons. If um, I want something, like a great example is I often help parents request a functional behavior assessment. And the schools often say no, it, it seems to be a thing. So if you're saying my student's behavior is really interfering with their learning and they're like, no, we disagree, we're not gonna do it. I would think that's a great time to say, I'd like to schedule a part two to this meeting in three weeks from now to follow up and see how he's doing on his goals. And then we can talk further about if his behavior is interfering with his learning. There, it kind of builds in some accountability there so they can't just brush you off and say, no, nah, we don't think that's a problem. Well, let's check back in a month and see if the data shows that it's a problem. I love that kind of move. Um, any questions about this? Like I said, I think this part is really important. Yeah, okay, Cheryl, I see your comment. And I, I, I hear that. I Cheryl says, I've never felt safe to say my disability. I think you're saying to disclose your disability to the IEP team, but you do ask them to slow down, which is good. Um, I'm not here. I don't, I don't identify as having a disability. It's not okay for me to tell a person with a disability, you should 
come out and tell everyone what you've got going on. Um, that's a really personal decision and I can see that there'd be risk to it. Um, I also see that there could be benefit because I do know when I've helped parents talk about that with the team, I often end up seeing the team be become immediately more flexible and understanding and kind than, um, and less rigid because they kind of then, disability is something I, they understand, I guess. Um, are they legally required to schedule a part two within what time frame? No, I don't think um, that they're legally required to schedule a part two unless they, I mean, if they run out of time and don't review the the whole IEP and you're not, I, I guess they are legally required. I, I'm going to be honest, I don't know the answer to that question. Cass, I see you said that sure didn't happen to me. Do you have, I don't, I'm not sure I know what you mean if you want to expand on that. Do you mean you didn't get more accommodations when you shared that you had a disability? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, not surprised, I guess. Disappointed to hear that, but not fully surprised. Um. Oh, my slides got all mixed up, hold on. Let's talk briefly about your child's voice being heard. Um. We should all consider if our child should attend that meeting. And I guess I would encourage you to add, I would encourage us to think about right now, when would it be appropriate and when is it not appropriate? Um, does anyone have thoughts on that? Well, it's something to think about. I think obviously age. Oh, Sherilyn, go ahead. Well, this is Sherilyn and yeah. um I, yes, as once he was in maybe eighth grade, um, started bringing him in, in part because I wanted them to talk to him. Mm -hmm. So that, that challenge of when the individual, when, when the other human person is right there next to you, and you get all the questions as if they're not there, really irks me. So... I do, we do have conversations and where he is in his disabilities and capabilities, I like being as straightforward about there's disabilities. That's not a thing one way or the other. It's just- yeah, There's no value attached to it. It just- right. right, Yeah, I love that. So it sounds like you're saying having that person there can really humanize the situation and, and um, create a more dignified experience. Yeah, and, and I, I see he, Katie's point though. That yeah, that discuss, I hear that from parents that sometimes they say, well, I don't want to talk about some of these things in front of him. It would be really upsetting to him. Um, Yana, you had your hand up. Yeah, hi. So I, uh, I know that when we talk about anything negative, even if it's just some challenges that um, kids have, that it could be, and it is often perceived by them as I'm the bad guy. I'm, I'm useless. I'm not a good person, and I'm, you know, I'm the problem, right? So, um, for a long time, uh, we haven't been bringing our kids um, to the to meetings for that reason, um, because, you know, they weren't seen for who they are. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes they would actually feel like when we did start bringing them, they would, especially one of them would leave and say, they don't care. They don't mm -hmm. really, you know, they don't understand because, you know, especially our eldest would feel dismissed that he, he has these kind of challenges. Um, and, you know, and yet he is, you know, but he's so smart. Mm -hmm. And um, he's like, well, like smart people can't um, have disability. You know, <laughs> so that's well, I, th I mean, I think what I hear is there's no right answer. There's no right answer. But if I think it's worth considering, well, it is worth considering. Should is my kid ready for this? Should my kid be there? W would it do more good than harm, more harm than good? But I think if they can't be there, either because um, maybe they can't cognitively um, follow what's happening, or maybe behaviorally they can't be there, or maybe emotionally it's too much for them. What I think it's also worth thinking, how can their voice still be a part of this? 
this process. Um, yeah, I see short visits. I think that's great. I think um, for some kids, it might be composing their own letter to the team that, of what their priorities are for the year. For some parents, it might, for some families, it might be mom and dad or parents sitting down with the child before the meeting and saying, how do you think this year went? Or what do you want for, from school? Or how would, you know, I know you've been pretty unhappy. What do you think could, what could we change to make things better and bring that information to the meeting? I think um, we could get creative in ways that we, we um, encourage in the ways that we include the voices of our IEP students that don't necessarily involve them being at the meeting if that's not going to work for them. Um, Yana, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just was going to say that one way for especially for kids who are, you know, it's really hard even but for adults to have a lot of adults there um, <laughs> from who are not the family, right? So it's really difficult to have a lot of staff, but for, for kids to have a lot of adults there, that's really hard too. So we've done also pre-meeting. So it would be just the case manager, me and the, and my kid and just to kind of prepare some things we want to talk about some things that you know we we get the input from him in you know in a small setting so that's mm -hmm. that's been really helpful that's great that's a great tip um bye Cheryl thanks for coming okay we're almost done here um last slide after the meeting, ask for any notes that were taken, review any notes to ensure they match your notes or your recollection. Um, I either in a, addition to that or instead of, if that's not how it works out, I think sending an email to the team, following up that reviewing everything that was agreed upon, including any action items is a really good strategy. Um, how often do you leave meetings thinking everything, thinking you all agreed to something only to find the team walked away with a very different idea than you of what was agreed upon? I think putting things in writing and just saying, just following up, this is my recollection. Can you confirm that this matches your recollection? And even if they don't answer to me, that's like, all right, now we have it in writing and um, there you now have a paper trail. Schedule a follow-up meeting if needed, like we talked about. Um, this is a whole other presentation I could do, but if you don't feel good about what happened at that meeting, explore your dispute resolution options. OSPI, our Office of the Superintendent of Public Superintendent of Public Instruction, gives us dispute resolution options, mediation, IEP, facilitated IEP, community complaint, due process. Um, those are all available to you, sort of at no charge. So this is a link where you can learn more about those options and I can help you with that stuff too at the art. And I went a little over time, but here's my contact information. And I will send these slides to Sherilyn and Sherilyn, you're welcome to share them with anyone. Oh, I see a great question. How many times are we allowed to have an IEP meeting per year? Anyone know the answer to that? You can have an IEP meeting as frequently as you feel the need for an IEP yeah. meeting. Unlimited. That's right, Trisha. And I mean, again, I don't want to abuse these teachers. I don't want to take advantage of their time. They are so busy. They're so overwhelmed. But if a meeting is needed, it's needed. I find sometimes the threat of requesting a meeting is enough to get something done sometimes because they're so busy. Like I could say... I'm hoping we can resolve this through email. I'd hate to have to call a meeting because they don't want to come to a meeting either. And so I see sometimes that can that can help speed things, can help move things along. Um, I think we're probably out of time, Cheryl. I don't want to keep. Well, we did. Oh. Hi, this is Cheryl Lynn. Uh, we did have a little. We have a little update. Um, our legislative advocacy chair is not feeling well, and so we will. We won't have a legislative advocacy update that does get us an extra 10 minutes. So if there are questions, if people have more they want to ask. And I do want to say, I just added a, a survey link to the chat. If 
just so you could provide feedback to me on this presentation. It helps us at the ARC like secure funds to be able to keep doing this. So if you would take just a minute or two to complete that survey, I'd be really, I'd really appreciate it. I see, um, weirdly enough, that same guy from the district very specifically asked me if we could try these accommodations for 30 days before requesting another meeting. I actually think that's a reasonable, well, let me say this. I think trying something for 30 days is wise. I think that that makes sense. We made these accommodations. Now let's implement them and see how it goes. But if we wait 30 days before scheduling a meeting, then all of a sudden it's another two weeks. Now we're waiting 45 days or all of a sudden we're bleeding into two months that we let go by. So I like to put a meeting on the calendar, even if we might eventually delete that meeting and not need it. That would be my my um, feedback if they're at all willing. Can we just put the date on the calendar? If we don't need it, we can cancel it. That kind of thing. Um, I hope this was helpful. I hope you feel more informed next time you go to a meeting and I hope you'll reach out to me um, if any questions come up in the future. And we will take, um, this is Cheryl Lynn, we will uh, take the slides and we'll make them available as a download on our website. Awesome. Um, I think I can get that done in the next couple of days or, okay, let's say by the end of next week, <laughs> I'm trying to give myself some real time. But if you need them sooner than that, you can reach out to me. I'll put my email in yeah. the chat. And the, uh, uh, if there are other questions, you know, you're also, if there's issues that come up, you can share them with either um, president at Seattle special education, PTSA.org or Seattle at or I'm sorry, hello at Seattle Special Education PTSA.org. And then if you see, uh, Rachel just put her email in the in the um, chat. Yeah. 